we talk about how to live in the now. And here's your host, Kim Martin Raymond. Peace and blessings and welcome to this edition of the How Now podcast where we talk about how to live in the now. I am your host, Kim Martin Raymond. I'm a minister, spiritual life coach, health and nutrition awareness coach, author, and founder of Redefining You LLC, where I help my clients to realign themselves, mind, body, and spirit. And if this is your first time listening to the How Now podcast, welcome to season three of our show. We are excited that you are here and if you uh, feel so inclined, please go to the website, www.hownowpodcast.com, and then click on your favorite podcast uh, platform where you can like, follow, and subscribe, or you can scroll to the bottom of the page, and it will take you to the, this week's banner for this week's show, and that will take you to the How Now YouTube channel where you can go on and like, subscribe, follow, and share and click that notification bell so you know what's happening in the now. Again, that is www.hownowpodcast.com. Let's get into tonight's show, which is entitled The Ride to Freedom. We're going to be talking about freedom rides, and we're going to be talking about techniques for social transformation through artistic expression. You know, this is Black History Month, but we already know that every day is Black history. 365 days a year. There is no day that is not without a time where we are, we have been touched or we have been influenced by those who are of color. And so to talk about this evening's topic is my has some guests here to my right. And as is as is as is customary for the How Now podcast, I'm gonna have my guests to introduce themselves at this time. Well, uh, greetings to uh, to you, uh, Sister Kim. It's an honor to join you. I certainly appreciate it. Uh, my name is Haki Haki Ami, spelled H A K I A M M I. I'm the president of the Teaching Artist Institute, and we're based in, in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. So it's a little cold here, but you know we <laughs> here just making things happen, and so we're excited about our, our work and what we need to do to, you know, continue to move our community forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was great having you here. And uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk about these freedom rides. But let's talk about the Institute at first. Like you said, you are the president of the Teaching Artist Institute. So tell us a little bit about what you do there. Well, certainly. The uh, Teaching Artist Institute was founded about seven years Actually, uh, Kempel was the founder uh, of that organization. And uh, so for the most part, we've been operating in uh, mostly Africa. Uh, yeah, I say in uh, Gambia, Ghana, and uh, we did several uh, operations in Uganda, tours and, and educational incursions, um, excursions, shall say, uh, mm-hmm. in Tanzania, Kenya, and this year we have some things coming up in Rwanda, Kenya, and mm-hmm. Tanzania as well. But um, so basically, uh, Teaching Artists Institute works with artists and other uh, creatives uh, to create opportunities using their, their mm-hmm. art form, whatever that form may be, uh, to create sustainable communities, educational, self development, and entrepreneurship. So we've done that. Uh, you know, over the past uh, few years, and we're excited because now we 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 realize we needed to bring some things home uh, and do some things here, working with with youth and students as and entrepreneurs as well. Okay, awesome! That is amazing. It's amazing work that you all are are doing, like you said, in your community and and abroad, and bringing them, uh, you know, stateside to to work with children. Mm-hmm. So, like I said, prior to the pandemic. Yeah, you because know, we always are talking about things that were going on prior to the pandemic. You were doing uh, you know, a, a lot of your work, like you said, abroad. And so when the pandemic hit, how did things change? Well, interesting. <laughs> um, so I, 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 sort of, I personally came on board. I knew about 
the work of the Teaching Artists Institute and some of the other members, affiliates that uh, Sister Kim has, you know, established the relationships with. But uh, so I actually came on board in 2020. And right then we were actually doing work in the Tanzania area. I mean, we were planning on, we had a conference scheduled for Tanzania and, you know, COVID came and we were able to keep that since Tanzania was one of the only countries that remained open. So we were able to keep that and, and, and ensure that we uh, still had that conference. But uh, perhaps even so last year, uh, in terms of, you know, people kind of coming back out or, you know, just exploring different operations, we had the, the opportunity to launch our uh, Freedom Rides here. And that started with a conversation with a sister, because we were talking, we were pitching, you know, Africa work. And she said, you know what, I think y'all should do, uh, you know, a Freedom Rides, and that's right down my alley. Then that I was an elected official in the city of Baltimore, and I still sit on the board of, of the Maryland Legislative Black Caucus Foundation mm -hmm. in the state of Maryland. So, uh, so th th those things were right down my alley. So it just made sense for us to optimize on an opportunity. We're still engaging cultural reclamation uh, with political, educational, legal uh, spin on it. So we, we have some good conversations with our uh, transformative uh, tour, uh, transformative ride, so I say. Okay, so talk to me a little bit about what that ride looks like, because I know, I mean, is it is it just strictly for youth or is it for anyone? Well, yeah, so we will have several adults. And interestingly, as I was promoting for this year's conference, I mean, we may have to even do two uh, this year. So we're excited about that. But so last year we started in, in you know, Baltimore. We didn't visit anywhere in Baltimore, but we went to DC, MLK, uh, MLK Museum, I'm sorry, MLK statue. And then the, uh -huh. the, the African-American, I actually got on a shirt, the African-American History Museum in DC. Nice. And that's just a phenomenal museum. So we went on to Farmville, Virginia, close to Richmond, and then the Greenville, Greensboro, uh, North Carolina, where the actual, um, uh, what do they call it, the, uh, the, the sit-ins took place where the four, they were called the Greensboro Four, that's the term, mm -hmm. where they were, um, where they were uh, arrested for, and it's, they actually have the actual Woolworth still there. So there we went to Greenville, South Carolina. That's where Jesse Jackson is from, and it has some historic significance there. And then to Atlanta, uh, all the MLK spots, the church mm -hmm. that they have. And, oh man, Selma, Jackson, Selma, Birmingham, uh -huh. Jacksonville, Mississippi, New Orleans. I think it's like two other places, Topeka, Kansas, and uh, Topeka, Kansas, and I don't know, what's the other one? Uh, oh man, it's one more, Kansas. Uh, it's one more place, but I don't have it in front of me, but it's so. <laughs> But um, so we end up flying back from Topeka, Kansas. I'm missing one other location inside of there. But so we 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 just had like some good experiences, uh, you know. Taking we had like over 31 young people that oh, came wow. from uh, from the Maryland area, and so mostly Baltimore uh, city where we're based. And so we, we're just excited to really put this together on another level. We're partnering with different uh, individuals this time. We have curators. We had an actual former state delegate, uh, Dr. Salima Marriott, that was our curator uh, last year. And so we're going to have some different curators this year, just to have people share their uh, experiences, elders, shall I say, who perhaps have lived during that time or, you know, can share some experiences uh, of their activism here, you know, so that that's what we look look for to make that happen. Awesome. So it happens through the institute, uh, and uh, you know, how do how do they find out about 
the um, actual Freedom Rides? Is it something that was advertised or, or do you, uh, you know, advertise to the local schools in that Baltimore area when you uh, did your first check? Yeah, so we one of one of one of our primary partners is the YMCA here in in uh, the Maryland YMCA, as well as uh, one of our partners is the, the, um, the International Civil Rights Museum, which is in Greensboro, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we we do a lot of events. I mean, this year we really were able to get out in front of this. Uh, and early to create the partners, create the the funding streams. So you know, we just go to different organizations and you know, just be be present in in the community with influencers and institutions. And so, and me being a former you know uh, member of the Democratic State Central Committee, I sort of know who's who to ask and you know who wants to do something constructive for our uh, youth and our community. And so we can't talk about, you know, issues that's going on and, and we're not, you know, invested in the future. So I feel, you know, honestly for me, if I'd gone on, on something like this at, at such an early age, who's to say where I would be? So that's, you know, what I'm excited about. Awesome. What is the age range for the, for, um, the, the youth? What is the youngest? So I'm sorry. So yes. Yeah, so the age range is from so high school students mostly. High school students. We've gotten like high school students, and we had a, a really real younger one that was like like twenty. I don't know. She was like eleven. She was the youngest, but she has like family. I mean, you know, we knew we know her family, so we thought that that was a good a good way to. Um, you know, partner with her. So we're excited about that. Mostly high school students, I'd say. So. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I see we have another guest who has joined us. Is is that Miss Poole? Yes, it could be her. It only can be her, right? <laughs> <laughs> Miss Poole, are you there? Yes, yes I am. Yes. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with you guys tonight. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us. For those who are who are, are listening in or those who are tuning in, uh, we have just been joined by Ms. Kim Poole. And Kim, if you can just introduce yourself briefly and then we'll go ahead and carry on with our conversation. Uh, Kim Poole, uh, founder of Teaching Artists Institute, Soul Fusion Performing Artists, uh, excited to show up and serve the community however needed using my art form. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, Mr. Ami was just talking to us about the Freedom Rides and talking to us about, um, you know, the, the places that you were going and just trying to get a, a feel for, for the importance of these, these uh, Freedom Rides and what, what they mean to the community and to the um, children and, and, and what the significance is. So your role in this, what has been, uh, you know, uh, we talked about the, the pandemic. We talked about how there were some pivots that took place, how you were doing some things abroad, and then how you, you know, talked about bringing things um, stateside. What were, um, you know, some of the thoughts that you had behind, uh, you know, bringing it stateside, doing the freedom rides, and, and what did you hope would be, you know, the, the, the things that the children would glean from that experience? Well, it's important for us to make sure that we're telling our own stories and taking history off the page is important because we need to make our story relevant to the next generation. History is not just 60 years ago or 100 years ago. It's, you know, today. Today is history because tomorrow is a whole new day. And we need to prepare our young people today to make new history. Um, building on the legacy that they stand on. And if they're not aware of that, um, we have to compete with TikTok and video games. And right. it's our job to do so, to be competitive. Um, we want to incentivize learning our history. We want to reestablish that as the norm. Um, that requires intergenerational conversations, using art as a tool for social transformation. And so 
Um, hopefully this is what the Freedom Rides is gonna do for this year. We do that in other experiences as well. We have the Underground Railroad Excursion, where we again take history off the page, a story of a woman right here from Maryland, just like me, Harriet Tubman, right? Seems so far away, such a distant history, mm -hmm. but I live just miles from where she first found her emancipation here in Baltimore. She left the Eastern Shore and decided that enough of, is enough. And she found liberation in my city of Baltimore after leaving the Eastern Shore. And so that should empower every young girl, um, old and young, you know, young is a state of being um, in Maryland, in Baltimore, to know that she first found liberation here. That was her first stop. And then you have Frederick Douglass, the same with him, right from down the street in Eastern Shore that decided, you know, we quote Frederick every year. Uh, what to a black man is the 4th of July and power concedes nothing. Um, and so these quotes, they have real relevance and significance and it should mean most to those that are right here walking down those cobblestone pathways and Fells Point, et cetera. But the young people, they go to the inner harbor, the inner harbor all the time and they have no knowledge of this history. Um, we still haven't been able to arrange a tour of the Frederick Douglass Isaac Myers Museum right in our own city. We've been trying mm -hmm. since 2019. They first said it was the pandemic. The next year they said it was a wedding ceremony taking place. The, in 2022, they referred us to the Baltimore National Heritage Site. So even the institutions that are charged with promoting and preserving our history are still gatekeepers that mm. send us through red tape and through loops to even use the services that are telling our story. And so the Teaching Artists Institute, the reason this work is so important, because it gives us an opportunity to craft our own story. And, you know, we just need to lobby for the resources. That's why we're so grateful for your platform. We hope there are people out there today that will say, hey, it's my dollar, or let me volunteer for an hour, or let me send my young person, because I think this is um, important, or let me be a part of that storytelling narrative. Let me be a griot so that I can facilitate intergenerational dialogue too. So, yeah. Yes, I, I mean, it's, oh no, no, that's just not, and look, that's what this platform is all about. It's all about being able to create spaces for us to have these vital conversations. These things are necessary, you know, and, and, and I'm grateful that there's an institute like yours that exists that allows us to have platforms that are pushing for this, for this information, pushing for, us to, to understand and know our heritage. And like I said, that's something I was saying to this uh, to our listening audience earlier, that is 365 days a year. It's not just February, it's not just this month or these out. Their you know, history is consistently being made. History mm -hmm. has stood the test of time. Like you said, it wasn't just 60 years ago. It's been something that's been ongoing and we have to be able to tap into it. You know, and then we have so many people out here who are creators. We have so many people out here who, who are, you know, are, are, are finding creative ways to express, you know, our experiences. But, but they have to have foundations as well. I believe that it's important that we did, that we lay the foundation so that that way we're building upon that. And, you know, we're having our youth to be able to pick, pick up the mantle and take, take over where we left off. So it's important that we have mm -hmm. platforms just like these. So, you know, I think it's, it's important to freedom rise. I think that that's wonderful that it's, it's called that. And how did, how did you kind of come up with that, that concept of freedom rise? So I did it, <laughs> not at all. Please don't give me credit. So the freedom rides, you know, it was to hold accountable the US government for their federal laws around interstate travel for African-Americans. Mm. May 4th, 1961, CORE, you know, James Farmer, they started the first Freedom Rides and that's what they called it. When they left Washington, DC and, you know, they were stopped on their way, they didn't make it. They were bombed and uh, in Anniston, Alabama, they were on their way to New Orleans, Louisiana, but they never made it. And so then you had a second Freedom Ride that left, you know, Nashville, Tennessee and the HBCU down there. Um, and they got on the road. And so this is nothing new. And many of the struggles that we're dealing with in this country, they're not new. And yeah. so that's why we have to keep the intergenerational conversation going so that you know, listen, 
a lot of these hurdles that you jump over, some of them, you know, they are going to be unique expressions of the symbolic landscape, but many of them are just going to be refashioned problems that we've already had to face and we've been doing work in that. So you don't have to start from scratch every generation. Right. Um, that, you know, it's not just about building generational wealth as it relates to capital and finance, but right. we need generational wealth as it relates to our culture. Culture is the new currency. Absolutely. We need to make sure that these wisdom, these pearls of wisdom, these golden nuggets, that we're hearing them from the mouths of our elders before they transition, because they won't be here. And then we will be relying on textbooks to have right. this story told. We're in a major um, shift. This, this time period is just a high vibration. Yeah. And only those that take advantage of it are going to benefit uh, from this great opportunity that we have. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like you said, we don't want to lose, you know, those things. You said something very important when we're talking about, you know, hearing the stories from our ancestors, those who, who you know, may not have long to be here before they transition. And it's so important because so much of our history, so much of our culture is seeped in storytelling and the things that, that you know, stories and, and things that were passed on. So many of the tangible things ha have been lost or have been destroyed. And so there are so many spaces, you know, that, that have been left, you know, and, and questions that have been unanswered because of the fact that, you know, th there's not anybody to, to fill in that gap or to be able to tell that story. And like you said, we can't rely on textbooks to be able to, to give an accurate account. And so- yeah. You know? So many implicit biases. Yeah. I mean, I just think about today, I was with the Maryland Commission on African American um, Historic Preservation, and we spoke with someone in the audience, then they're a part of a truth and reconciliation. But we as a community don't know the truth, because our stories were muted. So we can't have any reconciliation until we have the truth, until we tell our, we want those stories. Don't press it down. We have been pressing down that history that we've been trying to forget. Everybody is so quick. They want to reconcile. They want it to be over with. They're like, please, can we get over that era in history so that we can move on? But we're building on a bottomless bucket if we don't know the truth. If we don't look in our own family history and ask your grandmother, what happened to you? You know, my grandmother's 90 years old. She was alive when they had separate water fountains. She lived right. through Jim Crow, you know? And right. I think about uh, my grandmother. She was the first woman to own on Belvedere in Baltimore, a black woman owned nightclub. Wow. She knows what they were talking about when they say bootleg and liquor, you know? Right. <laughs> right. I'm not going to say that was the healthiest practice, Ooh. Right. But they understood that there was empowerment in being, uh, you know, a black owned entrepreneur and not having a regulation of, you know, right. people looking into your business and how that underground chitlin circuit really got started. That's and right. being able to get that story from her before she transitioned. You know, I remember stories of the Sunrise Club, you know, I'm a little right. off topic, but I'm talking about these precious memories. No, but and that's important. We, yeah. Yes, if we don't have these conversations with our elders, who's going to tell you if we don't tell our stories, right. who's going to be the truth and the truth and reconciliation as we right. hold this country accountable for, right. you know, the next steps like reparations and, you know, right. all those conversations and right. they're still doing doing the, the exploration bills. We can't even agree on exploration. My God, we have a long way to go. We and the young people need to know, they need to know that you're up next. This right. journey is not over and we want to give them hands-on practical things to do, best practices, and they need to know what's already been done so that they know what to do next. Yeah, I mean, and, and like I said, you touched on something key. My, my grandmother passed away uh, two years ago, January. She was 105, wow. 105 years old. And I mean, I have a granddaughter, so five generations. She got to meet her great-great-grandmother, you know? Wow. And so. I mean, how often are we going to have instances like that where we have longevity? We are losing our young people. You know, unfortunately, I, I, I lost my, my youngest daughter 14 years ago. So, you know, we, we, the legacies, the, 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 the time frame, the times that we're living, we're losing 
some of our youth, we're using, we're losing our our own children. You know, some to violence. We're losing some to to uh, you know health issues and things of that nature. So it is so important that we preserve those things that are 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 you know a part of our history because we don't know who's going to be here to carry that on. You know. Wow. And so, I mean, it, it, it is powerful what you say, because, you know, how, how many people can say that they even know their grandparents? Some children are born and they, they, don't, they don't even know their grandparents. Their parent, grandparents have been long since deceased. And so it's a different time that we're living in. And so it is so important for us to have other means and other resources of being able to, to know about our history. For those yeah. who may not have you know, ancestors who are here that, that can tell the story. So I'm loving the fact that there are platforms and that, that you're doing these freedom rides and that you have this institute where we can, you know, find other ways, other platforms to, to be able to, to, you know, pass on this information, to be able to, to show them the beauty in it. You know, there is some beauty, there is some pain, there are a lot of emotions that come along with this and, and we have to learn how to feel those emotions and not have them be based on anger, you know, because we're seeing a lot of that too. A lot of anger comes from some of this. And I think that's why at times you have people who will, will say, you know, I don't wanna talk about it, I wanna get past this because for some it's too much of an emotional, you know, situation for them. And they yeah. don't know which way and to go. You know what? But honestly, I invite their anger because anger has its place yeah. in the activation of our movements. Um, you know, I, a lot of people say, oh, I can't stand this generation. They so entitlement. I, you know, so much entitlement. I invite their entitlement. They say, I deserve this respect. Mm. I deserve these resources. And so when I say anger, it doesn't mean that I want you to go out and as a result of your anger, right. hurt somebody, but I want you to know in your emotional state when there has been a trigger, when there's a barrier, when a border has been crossed, when somebody right. has done something inappropriate, your emotions are like your moral compass. They right. help you determine when somebody is in the wrong because you may, you know, you may, what did I say? You may forget what someone says, Maya Angelou said this, but you'll never forget how they made you feel. Right. And you may not be able to articulate why what they said or what they did is an offense, but your emotional system will tell right. you I'm angry. Right. Right. And so what you do about your anger, you know, right. that may be what we need to discuss, but it's okay to get angry. It's okay to get right. downright upset. Right. And it doesn't and what... you have to stay there, but right. that is a part of the process. And I don't want you to feel like you have to skip to the peaceful part. You have to right. skip, you know, to the, I'm okay now. No, I'm upset. Right. I have the right to be upset and I'm not okay. And it's okay to say, I'm not okay. Right. And like you said, that's the beauty of it all. The, the beauty is being able to, to have platforms where there can be self-expression. And just yeah. like you said, if there is anger, it's okay to be angry. And like I said, you know, you have people who want to suppress that. No, I don't want to talk about that. No, we need to have those conversations. We need to understand why, because sometimes if we understand why certain things happened or why things went the way they went, we can begin to, to process it and say, okay, I may not agree with it, but I understand or, or you know, I agree to disagree with this. And here's why, to be able to articulate you know, why it is that we're feeling the way it is because, I mean, the, why we're feeling the way we are. We always tell our young boys, you know, man up, you know, stop crying, don't do this. And it's so important for us to be able to express ourselves so that that way, you know, just like our, our body has to be in that state of homeostasis. When it gets hot, you know, we sweat. When, you know, when we feel pain, we may win, so we may cry. Those are natural things that happen. We have to make it become more natural for us to experience the things that we have without going to the extreme. And that mm -hmm. comes with understanding, that comes with, with knowing what's going on around us so that that way we can make, you know, conscious decisions about the things that we do. We can make informed and educated decisions about the things that we do and how we react to certain things. And we can't do that if, if 
we're, we're not knowledgeable, if we're not seeking that education, if we're not, you know, being exposed to the things that are going on around us. And, you know, that's the beauty of the Teaching Artists Institute, because we value artistic expression. And until you have practice experiencing a wide range of emotions, you don't know how to channel them into building institutions for your community, um, because you don't even know the limit or the height of your power. Um, but, you know, your power is your emotional state. That is what allows you to tap into your passion, tap into your ability to create. You know, I, I hate to say it, but some of my best songwriters are only great when they say it. You know, I think of Mary J. Blige. I mm -hmm. love saying Mary. Oh my God, <laughs> some of the things that she's right. written. Right. Such a soul. <laughs> I yeah. said, you know, I want her to be healed though. I'm, you know, I'm celebrating her healing because she yeah. is whole. I see her progress. They had the Grammys last night. She said, you know, good morning, gorgeous. I loved every bit of it. But I'm telling you, I saw the range of her soul when mm -hmm. she was broken. And I know that other women could relate to that. And so when you are learning to use your emotional state as a tool yeah. for creation, now you have the power. Now you are determining your behavior. How is my behavior gonna affect my habits? And how are my habits gonna build institutions for my people? Yes, yes. And that's what it's all about. It's all about, like you said, that, that expression. And so uh, in your institution, in your, in your art institute, what are some of the platforms in which they do it? I know that you, they, they do it through music. What are some other ways in which uh, you are um, doing expression through um, you know, social transformation? What are some other means? So, so for us in the Teaching Artist Institute, art is everything. Um, it's ideas, it's creative thinking, design thinking. It's the moment that you decide to incept, conceptualize a thought. That inception is art to us um, because we understand that um, art is everything, everywhere, everybody, all the time. You're the artist. The moment that you decide to think thoughts for yourself. Um, and so, yes, traditional arts matter. Um, at the same time, we want to empower everybody in society to tap into that creative energy, into that vibration, so to speak. Um, so for us, what that looks like, it shows up differently across the regions where we work. We work in eight countries, um, six of which are on the continent of Africa. And really, we believe artists are essential workers. They should be resources to their communities. And so as an artist, as a creator, it's your job to determine what does my community need? Mm -hmm. And as a result, use your creative energy to be um, a resource, find a need and fill it. Um, that's the artpreneurial mindset that we're sharing. Um, so for us here in the DMV, the Baltimore area, during the pandemic, we learned that housing was a major issue. Um, and so, we started an artist in residence. And so we have artists that rent the rooms on the top floor of our office space. Um, we also, in the region of the Gambia, we have many visual artists and we also have farmers. A lot of people don't realize that agriculture, i.e. culture, was the first form of culture and that's an art form. And so we're you know, teaching in Ghana rappers to create messaging around why farming is cool because you have this mass exodus uh, in Ghana of uh, agriculture workers. And it's like, you see your mother, she's in the dirt with a hoe and a shovel. And you say in your mind, no, I'm gonna be a professional. I'm gonna get a suit and a tie. I'm gonna get me an office. I'm gonna be a lawyer or a doctor or somebody really legitimate and important. Not realizing that agriculture is one of the biggest business developments Globally, especially when you're living in fertile ground, like right. in Ghana. And right. so using artists like rappers that already have influence to change the mindset, that is a creative activity that you know we're doing. I think about Trigmatic back to 2017 mm -hmm. and Daddy um Daddy Bosco and you know, all the Ghanaian uh, um rappers and reggae artists and you know, Vice, Obor. Um just doing incredible work uh, to change the mindset. So that, you know, it just really looks different. But what we know is that wherever we're creating, 
wherever we're innovating and whatever design thinking we're engaged in, that it is a tool to transform our society. Social, that's us and everybody. The transformation is the process, not saying that we're gonna manage our conflicts and you know manage around them, that we're gonna problem solve as if our problems are gonna go away, but transformation acknowledges that our process is just ebb and flow like the mm. we will always have things to be considered problems to be solved but we get better because we're in the flow and the more we accept the fact that this is just a part of life and development um you know it's just more natural that way and mm. so that is the art for social transformation that we speak of that is amazing that is amazing and i'm just like yet yeah, I, I love that it's not just the common things that that people that you know people say oh it's an art institute oh you know it's just going to be drawing it's just going to be you know dance it's just going to be you know song it's going to be things like that i love that you say that it is tapping into what is needed in our society in our communities and saying okay now we're going to find creative ways in which to build on that you know it's about going back into our communities and not just saying, okay, I'm going to soar and go beyond this and be removed from that area that needs us. So yeah, I'm a lot of I'll say um a lot of the European thinking around art is uh it is for the experts among us, it is separate for the elite, you know, like a museum up away from the people. But in the African worldview, art is integrated into the community. It's a everybody thing. In South Africa, everybody sings. The choirs, you know, right. I love South African choral music. Um, you know, in the dancing that I see in Tanzania on the East Coast, um, even in Baltimore. I mean, you know, I see the kids, they have the circle. You know, I remember right. dancing the club music. Everybody gets a turn. We have the circle. Right. And, you know, like even if we're freestyling, the freestyle goes around the circle. It doesn't That's matter right. if you're AZ or Nas, right. you know, everybody gets a chance. So artists, everybody. Um, but what I will say is we won't forsake the traditional artists, though, because traditional artists also need to be valued in uh, their offerings around thinking. We need to bring them to decision making tables yeah. um, because they have no incentive as creators. They're like a muse or a conduit of creative energy. And so we need to invite them into the space. And though the Teaching Artists Institute is not just about music and it's not just about dance, there is a metaphysical realm that is connected to when you engage in those traditional mediums with experts that uh, I'll say allow themselves to be used in that way. So it's a delicate balance, what can I say? Um, right. But I understand what you're saying. It's like every time you hear teaching artists, it's like, oh, let the kids put their hands in some paint and put murals on the wall. Wow. But it's like, no, I'm also that artist to say, we're not going to paint over pollution. Let's talk about air. Let's talk right. about water. Let's talk about food. I'm that kind of artist. <laughs> yes, yes. And I'm sitting down my right. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because, it, because it's so important for us to be exposed to these kinds of things. It's not something that, that is common. You know, it's platforms like this. Th this, is the, this is the reason why these platforms, this is the reason why How Now exists, because we're wanting to create platforms for people to understand that, that, you know, we all have a part in this. We are all part of this body. We are all part of this, this system and, and it's, it's how we fit into that. It's not, it's not a mold. There are a whole lot of moving parts. How do we come together? How do we d create or, or you know, establish areas that, that can help us to develop and grow as individuals? You know? And we are learning from one another. And if we can't you know, begin to connect those dots, you know, we're, we're, we're putting ourselves at a disadvantage. You know, there, have to be a, there has to be a time where we're coming together. There has to be a time where we're, we're trying to problem solve and to try to see, you know, what is it that, that's necessary? What is it that's needed? What is it that we have to do differently or things that we can do better 
And if we're, you know, if we're sitting on our laurels and not, you know, taking an interest in that, we're putting ourselves like to at a huge disadvantage. So I mean, I, I am grateful for the things that you're doing, for the ideas that you're sharing, for the platforms that you're creating, especially for our youth, you know, because they are our future and we need to know, okay, what is our future going to look like? You know? Well, and we tell young people all the time, especially on the Freedom Rides, they meet so many young activists from my recent history. And we tell them, you have the energy, you have the entitlement, like your job is to transform society today. Tell us what you need, what tools you have. My job is to be your cheerleader, to give you opportunities for exposure and, you know, visceral back and forth like the fan on the ceiling go back and forth with you about what we need because these young people martin luther king was assassinated he wasn't yet 50. let's be honest like these people that we celebrate in black history they were young people malcolm x you know barbara john he was 16 years old in farmville virginia you know the second stop on our freedom rides tour and so we don't want our young people to be mistaken to believe you have to be a full grown adult to change your community, right. be a leader today and tomorrow, because we need you. I love you have that. to practice, practice being who you want to be now. Yeah. And right. so let us support you in that. Make your mistakes now so that you don't have to make them later. Um, in addition to that, I think it's so important that we give our young people um, exposure. We have so many gatekeepers that keep them from taking the mantle of leadership because when they were young, they didn't do the work. And so now they're not elders. They just messed around and got old. They haven't built institutions. And so they stand at the helm of institutions that they should really be trying to co-create and co-curate with younger demographics, younger people. And, um, but at the same time, we in the European society, we throw our elders away. We've been taught to do that. Once you get old, you're not useful. Anything over 21 is on right. your way down. So put you prepare for the nursing home because that's where right. you're going. But we value our elders. And so it doesn't mean that because you're preparing the young person for leadership, uh, using their energy uh, and their legs to be the legs of the movement, that you're not that wisdom bank that we draw from as an elder. And so that delicate balance has to be reestablished in our community. And that's why the Freedom Rides Tour is so important because we wanna facilitate those intergenerational dialogues. Right, right. And then, and then it also creates a space to have a conversation and for them to ask questions, you know, and to be able to get, you know, answers from people who, who have the experience, who have the knowledge, we don't want our children to to you know base their their wisdom and knowledge on things that they see on social media, you know. Yeah, it's like make new mistakes, right? <laughs> you don't have to make my you'll make mistakes. You'll make plenty, but hopefully you'll make some new ones so that we can keep failing forward. If that makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. I love that failing forward. Did y'all get that? Failing forward. <laughs> That's important. It is important. Like you said, it's important to make mistakes, but we, we want to be able to, you know, have spaces where, where we can have those conversations. The conversations need to be had. They don't need to be something that, that's, uh, you know, become public opinion, uh, you know, popular opinion because it's, it's shown on, on, you know, a platform where anybody can say anything and it be taken for, for, for the truth. And so, you know, it's important that, that people tap into, you know, like I said, the Art Institute, that they tap into the, the Freedom Rides, that they, you know, go and, and into some of these establishments. And like I said, it's unfortunate. Like you said, you have some that are the gatekeepers and, you know, it's like, okay, you loosen your grip on those keys a little bit and let us start tapping into some of those things, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Unlock a couple of those doors and let us see what's behind there because you know it's something that's going to benefit us. It's not going to harm us. It's going to help us to get to that place of growth so that we can reach back to those who you know, need to be informed. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, they, they, what is it? They're weaker, but they're wiser. But I think um, you know, what that really translates to uh, 
for us today is that we have access to so much information, but it doesn't mean anything because we, you know, we don't have, we don't know what to find, you you know, having Mm. access to Google and being, uh, you know, able to Google anything and have information at the tip of your fingers, but not knowing what to Google, what to search for. Right. Right. So that's why those conversations are necessary. They keep us focused. Yeah, they do. They do. Well, I know we're getting close to wrapping things up here, but what I do want to do is two things. I always ask my guests, uh, you know, before we close our show, uh, to talk about what they're doing to navigate in this now, to navigate in this space. What are some things that you're doing to live in the now? Live in the now. Wow. <laughs> that seems like such a relevant, easy question. Mm-hmm. But the truth is, is being grounded is so difficult when you're constantly planning for tomorrow. And so basic things like mothering myself, making sure that I eat, making sure that I drink water often, making sure that I go to sleep at a certain time and that I stop working at a certain time and that, you know, I wake up and I do my prayers, you know, and I have that talk with God, that tea time with God, that I grind my ginger and my lemongrass. I sell those products, but making sure that I actually drink and consume what I sell. And so basic mothering reminds me to live in the now, just, uh, being healthy and being intentional about self-care with yes. the simple things. Yes, yes, that's wonderful. I don't know if Haki is still there because I would love for him yes, to, to, to answer that there. question as well. What are some things that you are doing to live in the now? Well, uh, what I'm doing to in the now, I'm, I'm planning for retirement. That's one thing. <laughs> uh, so everything involves around getting free for me, honestly, I, I, I'm, I'm practical in the context of, you know, thinking about quality of life yeah. fundamentally. And so, you know, just, just being around uh, the right people, positive people, uplifting people, healthy people, people that are uh, doers and visionaries. Uh, I, I find that if you're the smartest one in your group, you need a different group to right. be around. So. So that's, you know, and I, I'm feeling really good about, you know, this month and, you know, all of our evolutions. I mean, we recently, just a, a you know, add on, we recently were featured in what's called the Baltimore Times newspaper. Mm-hmm. And uh, on the cover of that was the new governor of Maryland. Uh, his name is Governor Westmore, the first black governor of, of mm-hmm. Maryland. And so we were in that edition of the paper. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I just feel confident that, you know, from from business, just practical things, you know, just how you move and how you uh, cross reference your, your network to yeah. ensure that you are, you know, just, just hitting the different sectors and different community influencers so that we can ensure we're serving the young people properly because that's what it's all about. Yeah. So I make sure that, you know, I'm in the right places and 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 we hold people accountable to do what we say we should be doing. That's it, to do the work, to do the work. That is awesome. Okay, and now the next thing I always ask is, please tell people how they can get in contact with you if they're interested in the Institute, if they're interested in Freedom Rides, how can they get in contact? So always, always Facebook, www.facebook.com slash teaching artists, one word. And please like us and share us. Even if you don't have money to give, that is such a big benefit. Somebody in your network may be interested in something that we're doing, not just with the Freedom Rides, maybe somewhere around the world. So please help us share and get the word out. Share this video. This is an incredible platform. This is the power of the Kims. We got Kim (laughs) over here. So this is the Kim connection popping off. So Mm -hmm. please share her platform as well. Um, You know, living in the now. um, Mm -hmm. I appreciate the opportunity again. Yes, yes, yes. Like I said, this is this is something that's so important. Like I said, our history is not just you know to be contained in the month of February and they say, well, you know, it's just it. it, You know, it is a time when people highlight, but 
like I said, 365 days a year, every day, all day, every minute of every mm -hmm. hour. You know, there is a person that is being born of color. There's a person that is, is, you know, being birthed into this world to be a legacy for, for all. So, you know, it, it doesn't just stop here. There are so many opportunities for us to be creatives, for us to, to, to uh, express our heritage, our culture, and, and things that, you know, are relevant in our lives, you know, to, to, to know that, you know, we have purpose. We have relevancy in all things that we do. And, and the only way that we're going to be able to empower and to be able to uplift one another is to educate ourselves so that we're moving again from that space of fear to a space of understanding and knowledge that we can reach back and, and help those along who are struggling. You know, It's a matter of figuring out what we can do for community. So are there any other parting words that you'd like to leave with our listeners as we you know, reflect on the things that we talked about this evening? Well, I'll just say, in case you missed it, culture is the new currency. Please remember that. Remember that culture is the new currency. It is the most valuable asset that we have, that we possess, that we trade and barter. Um, remember that, 365, culture is the new currency. Kim Poole told you first. That's right. Culture is the new currency. You heard it. Okay, you all see it on a t-shirt, right? <laughs> yes, we did. We did. Yes, we did. We all have right. Hey, all right. We see? did it. Yeah, right we did. Bam. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay. There's power in there, okay? Culture is the new currency. But I would like to thank you so much for being with me, Kim <laughs> and Hockey. Thank you so much for thank taking you. time out of your schedule to be with us and to talk about this important topic as we move forward and know that, you know, no one is ever a one-time guest on the How Now podcast because what's happening now may not be what's happening two hours from now, two weeks from now, two months from now, two, two days from now. You're always welcome to come back. You are part of the How Now family. And so I thank you again for taking time to be with us and we wish you the best in all that you continue to do moving forward. Okay, thanks so much. And that will do it for this edition of the How Now podcast. Which is how to live in the now. And until I see you all the next time, I say peace.